afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this press briefing with regard to what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. As always, we remind people that we need to continue to focus on social distancing, all the good hygiene things we've talked about, washing our hands frequently, using the hand sanitizers, and so forth. Also, our six rules for keeping Nebraska healthy, right? Don't take unnecessary trips outside your household. Make sure that if you're working from home, well, work from home if you can, but work six feet distance from everybody. Uh, respect the 10-person rule. If you're uh, going out to shop, shop once a week. Have a list. Be efficient. Don't take the whole family. Help kids by keeping them at home to play or and avoiding playgrounds and group sports. Help seniors by shopping for them so they don't have to go out. They can stay in but don't go visit a long-term care facility. And of course, exercise once a day at home or in an appropriate socially distanced way. So please continue to remember those rules. Uh, also, oh, they're over here. So um, also just remember, testnebraska.com is how we are really expanding testing here in the state. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But we wanna remind people that testnebraska.com, please sign up, help give us an assessment of the state. It takes less than five minutes, your data is secure. We're only using it for this testing program, and this is how we are scheduling people to do testing. So please keep that in mind. Uh, and then always, as always, all the restrictions we've put in place are to preserve the healthcare system, and again, the healthcare system continues to remain in, in very good shape. We've got 46% of our hospital beds available. It's about the same where it was yesterday. 40% of our ICU beds available and 77% of our ventilators available. So lots of capacity in the hospital system. All the sacrifices and restrictions, things that people have done, have worked to be able to make sure that anybody who shows up to the hospital can get that ventilator, that hospital bed, that ICU bed. So all working as planned. Uh, then the testing schedule, uh, we're doing National Guard testing in Omaha, Fremont, David City, and Wahoo. So that's kind of the regular program. So for example, in Omaha uh, at the One World Center, we're testing people there as an example of how we're doing it, not the Test Nebraska dot program. And then we are doing Test Nebraska in Omaha, uh, separate other sites in Omaha, Lincoln, um, let's see where else, uh, North Platte, Scotts Bluff, Thedford, West Point, and David City this week. So again, that's where testnebraska.com is. You cannot just show up though. You have to go sign up through testnebraska.com to be able to get that scheduled. So don't just show up at the testing facilities. Go sign up for testnebraska.com. All right, so one of the things I wanted to do today is just kind of lay out all the things we've been doing in one place with regard to how we're tackling fighting coronavirus in Nebraska. And that's what this chart over here represents. So it starts with doing that testing and identifying people who are testing positive. And this is something we've been ramping up over the course of the last several weeks. In fact, over the last week, we have completed 22,200 tests. The previous week, before that, it was 13,300 tests. So you can see we've been able to ramp up testing significantly. And this is through testnebraska.com, it's through the private labs we're doing, it's everybody expanding their testing capacity is helping us deliver more testing. So that's a, a key thing as part of how we fight this because once we identify somebody who has tested positive, then comes the next step, which is contact tracing. This is reaching out to them to let them know they need to isolate, stay home so they don't infect anybody else, and then asking them who they've been in contact with over the last two weeks so we can reach out to those folks and determine what level of exposure they had and if necessary, have them quarantine or monitor their symptoms depending on the level of exposure. But this is the contact tracing aspect. Uh, one of the things that this would normally be done is at the local level through local public health departments. But again, with the magnitude of this emergency, they don't have the resources by themselves to be able to do this. So the state has been ramping up our contact tracing leveraging our, our teammates in Health and Human Services, 264, or two, uh, 264 people have been trained, sorry, 266 people have been trained, and uh, that are helping out now. And then this week we brought on PRC, an Omaha firm that is, has got 40 folks, half of which are bilingual, that are supplementing that, and then we'll bring on other private firms, and ultimately what we'll do is we'll let our team, state teammates go back to their regular jobs while bringing in um, you know, private firms to be able to do this contact tracing 
for the long term. So that's kind of our overall plan with regard to contact tracing. And our goal is to get to 1,000 contact tracers so that we can do a very robust job of following up with people who have tested positive and then their contacts to make sure that they are staying home if necessary so that they don't infect people and really switch this around so that we're focusing on the people who have been impacted by coronavirus while letting the rest of us go back to a more normal life. So that's kind of how the contact tracing works. This is a long-established public health tool that we are ramping up here in Nebraska. The third aspect is lodging. And this is to, uh, has a variety of different ways through, ne through the Nebraska Accommodation Project. We do hotel rooms for first responders and healthcare workers who maybe want to make sure they're not carrying the virus home or worry that they're going to be getting the virus at home and don't want to bring it into work. So we've got hotels arranged for that. We also have arrangements with the dorms at UNO, UNL, UNK. Uh, we're working out other arrangements as well with state colleges and so forth so that if we, uh, people need to either quarantine or isolate there, they can do that. Uh, so this would be general members of the public who maybe can't go home. Say, for example, they've got an elderly person at home and they don't want to take the, the virus back there. We'll find a place for them to be able to isolate so they can do that safely. We also have opened this up to people working in the food processing industry. So people who, again, for the same reason, either they don't want to go home to expose other family members or they're worried about getting exposed at home, they can take advantage of this program to be able to isolate away from those folks. So that lodging is a key part of following up on the testing and the contact tracing to allow people to do that. Now, another aspect of fighting the virus is making sure that the folks who need to have that personal protective equipment have that available. You may recall at the beginning of this emergency, that was a big issue for a number of organizations, making sure they had proper PPE. So we at the state have stepped in to buy large amounts of PPE using our buying power to be able to do that, to bring it into the state and then distribute it out to organizations through our local public health districts. So organizations contact our local public health departments. They make a list. They submit it to the state. We supply that PPE to them. They distribute it out to long-term care facilities or doctors or hospitals or whomever, those healthcare first responders, volunteer firefighters, whoever might need that. So they're then getting that out to those organizations in their community that may be short of PPE. So that's that, how that program works. We now have 60 to 90 days of PPE on hand for things like masks and face shields and gloves and gowns and so forth. So to be able to provide that out to folks. So we're feeling very good about where we stand with regard to PPE. The next part of our plan has to do with at-risk populations. And we've talked a lot about this with regard to some of the things the state is doing. So for example, just recently on Friday, we talked about what we're doing with long-term care facilities and asking them to come back with that additional plan for the rest of the year on how they're gonna manage the coronavirus, how they're going to manage things such as family visits and mental health care and so forth. So uh, we also mentioned that the folks at Nebraska Medicine and UNMC go out and visit these facilities. The ICAP program, which has been doing that for the last couple, of, actually four and a half years, uh, going out and consulting about uh, infection control and so forth. So this is part of our overall plan with those at-risk populations. And it also includes uh, working with our local public health departments around homeless shelters. Uh, again, uh, Shelly Sweet Home goes out and visits those shelters to be able to help them think about how they're going to be doing quarantine and isolation and so forth. Uh, we've talked a lot about with the food processors and how we have uh, our team going out to visit them and establishing the meat processors COVID-19 playbook, which is a playbook of best, best practices that the state has published through UNMC's Global Health Center, uh, Center for Global Health Security, to be able to create those best practices for food processors so they can be following along with those and the site visits and so forth with regard to what we're doing to work with that environment where it's very difficult to socially distance in those facilities. So again, part of our overall effort work with those at-risk populations. And then finally, our Department of Corrections is another example. Uh, we have had a plan there, well, for a long time with regard to how to deal with these sort of things. But again, we've got plans in place to be able to manage that population. So a lot of our folks, we, we focus on some of these high-risk populations that we have seen around the country where it's tough to socially distance, and so we put additional effort into those plans. And then uh, we talk about guidelines. So we've published DHMs that actually put in these restrictions. We put out guidelines for how businesses are supposed to operate. So that's part of our continuing um, advice to folks, either 
specifically uh, in a DHM, which is a law, as, as a matter of law, um, you know, it's a restriction in the law versus a guidance uh, where we've talked about some of the distinctions in the past, but this is what, how you should be operating your business, and we strongly suggest you do that. So we put out that guidance for people to be able to follow. And ultimately, all this is what I, about what I said earlier, preserving the hospital system, preserving our hospital capacity. That is what all these things are meant to preserve at the end of the day, is to make sure that we have that ability to provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, that ventilator to anybody who needs it at the time they need it, and we've been successful in making that happen here in Nebraska. That's how we know we're winning this fight, because we've been able to manage that everywhere in the state to preserve that hospital system. So th I just want to kind of give that overview of how we think about this and the kind of areas that we're focused on to be able to continue to deliver on fighting the coronavirus, and then as we loosen, continuing to work these issues as we go forward, as we loosen those restrictions. All right. Uh, one of the other things that we have done is working together with um, University of Nebraska Omaha Center for Public Affairs, as well as the Department of Economic Development, is through uh, ha is to do a business survey for uh, businesses here in Nebraska. Now, we put these restrictions in place to preserve that hospital system, that healthcare system that I, I mentioned, but it's had tough consequences for the businesses here in the state of Nebraska. So April 15th through the 24th, uh, the Center for Public Affairs did a survey out to businesses to find out how they've been impacted. 4,500 businesses responded, 87% said they had been impacted in a negative way. And you won't be surprised to hear that some of the industries that were impacted the most were things like arts, entertainment, and recreation, food services, uh, also healthcare and social services. Those kind of industries were the most impacted with regard to the restrictions that we've put in place. And so today we've got Kathy Lang, who is the state director of the Nebraska uh, Center for Business Development, uh, to be able to talk about the results of that survey and some of the things that we found out when we asked Nebraskans and Nebraska business owners how they had been impacted by the pandemic and um, some of the restrictions we put in place. So, Kathy, I'm going to ask you to come up and say a few words about that. Thank you, Governor. Um, it is an honor to be here today to announce the Nebraska Business Response Survey Report. As the governor said, I'm Kathy Lang, the state director of the Nebraska Business Development Center, a center of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. NBDC is a statewide organization providing business services to Nebraska businesses to help them start and grow all across our state. The Nebraska Business Response Survey was a great collaboration among business, state, and university interests to gauge the impact of COVID-19 on businesses and organizations in Nebraska. The survey, which the governor helped us kick off on April 15th, is allowing us to, uh, to explore the range of challenges that COVID-19 presents to Nebraskans in the business and nonprofit sector. As a result, we are able to offer insights and solutions based on the information that so many Nebraskans have provided. We had an exceptional response to the first survey, and we want to thank those businesses and organizations that participated. Their help and timely feedback added so much value to the state's plans and actions to respond to COVID-19. The survey effort will continue in June with a second survey of the organizations that indicated their willingness to participate. The information in subsequent surveys will allow us to understand how COVID-19 impacts are evolving and allow us to continue to provide timely information to policymakers. You will be able to find the survey report on many websites the Nebraska State Chamber, the Nebraska Department of Economic Development, the University of Nebraska, the governor's website eventually today, and of course, nbdc.unomaha.edu. 
nbdc.unomaha.edu. We hope you'll take a look at that survey report. The survey shows the breadth and depth of the economic impact today of the virus on the Nebraska economy. The impact is vast, touching every part of Nebraska and every industry in Nebraska. As the governor said, 87% of respondents have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. And yet, while we are all acutely aware of the negative impacts of COVID-19 on the economy, the survey shows that something very special is happening in our state. While 89% of respondents said their revenue is down, Nebraska businesses and nonprofit organizations are actively working to maintain their employees and the hours of those employees. We are very encouraged by this response and we think it is very telling for Nebraska. Let's just say that our businesses and organizations are doing all they can to keep the economy of Nebraska going. Lastly, I want to share with you the top three concerns that Nebraska businesses and organizations have shared with us. First, the financial impact of COVID-19 on their operations, their liquidity, and their capital. Second, they're very concerned about the duration of the outbreak and the quarantine efforts. And lastly, the top th of the three concerns is decreasing customer and consumer confidence and spending. I wanna thank the partners to this survey, the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Omaha Chamber, the Lincoln Chamber, the Nebraska Department of Economic Development, and my colleagues at the University of Nebraska, at UNO, the Center for Public Affairs Research, at UNL, the Bureau of Business Research, and of course, the Nebraska Business Development Center. Uh, the report is available uh, publicly, as I said. It's broken down in three sections. The first section is all of the statewide information. Where did the survey responses come from? What was generally said by our businesses and organizations across the state? Then the report goes into uh, detail about industries and how individual industries were impacted. And lastly, we have regional breakdowns of the report information. Uh, we stand ready to provide these reports to organizations across the state to help them as they are trying to navigate through this incredibly challenging economic time. Governor, thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Kathy. We appreciate it. And again, thank you to all the businesses and nonprofits who filled out that survey. We appreciate your help on this. And uh, again, this will be part of the input that uh, Tony Goins is using as he's thinking about his plans for economic development. So thank you, Kathy. All right. Uh, executive orders. We have some executive orders that are set to expire at the end of the month. So the executive order with regard to public meetings, I had waived some statutes to allow government entities to be able to have public meetings, say using a Zoom call or a conference call, as long as they were allowing people to be able to dial into that. We will be extending that through the month of June. However, I wanna let everybody know that it will not be extended beyond that. So those government entities that are using that right now with regard to their meetings are gonna to need to be thinking about over the course of the next six weeks or so, how they are going to change that going forward in July. So they'll have to make some changes, but they've got six weeks to plan, but we will be extending that one. Uh, we had another executive order with regard to uh, the time frame that courts had to be able to process eviction notices. We are not gonna be extending that one into the month of June. The uh, CARES Act money and the unemployment numbers uh, money is uh, coming out to folks. So for example, uh, we've been able, as we've talked about last week, been able to process through about two thirds of the backlog we had with regard to um, the unemployment claims and we're continuing to work on that. So our concern is we don't want people to fall too far behind on rent and not be able to catch up. So with the $600 a week they're receiving in pandemic unemployment and so forth and all those other benefits, we think people ought to be able to be focusing on making sure that they don't get too far behind on the rent, so we're not gonna be extending that order. And then the final one had to do with turkey hunting season. That one actually, turkey hunting season ends May 31st anyway, so there's no need to extend that one. Uh, and then again, that was uh, an executive order not allowing people from out of state coming in to do turkey hunting. 
Uh, okay, schedule for this week again, 2 p.m. Central Time, briefings in English, in English every day, 5 p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays, Spanish language briefing. Um, I think that's what we got before we roll into questions and answers. Oh, Thursday night, NET, 8.30 to 9.30. So let's get to our questions. Uh, Rob McCartney, KETV, when, when will the Fully Funded CARES Act benefit of 13-week unemployment extension for those who have reached their 26-week limit, 26 week limit be implemented? That is supposed to be, Rob, that software is supposed to be implemented tomorrow, and so the payments will get processed over the weekend. So thanks for asking about that one. That's one that we've uh, had on our to-do list. Tiffany Hendricks, Weimar Arbor State. With other states changing their death rates to reflect dying with versus dying of COVID-19, how can we be assured deaths reported in Nebraska are accurate and our death rates are not inflated? So the way this works is that the doctor or the medical examiner makes that determination with regard to what the cause of death was. So they fill that out on the death certificate. Now that death certificate does allow for them to say the person specifically died because of coronavirus. But I also could say they died with that condition that they had it as well. We leave that up to that doctor or that medical examiner to decide what the cause of death was, and we'll, re we'll report what they decide. So that's what we've been doing at the state, really leaving it up to the doctor or the medical examiner. There are all sorts of standards and procedures or rules with regard to how they're supposed to make that decision. So there are published guidelines out there for how those doctors and medical examiners do that, then they're supposed to be following those guidelines, and then we're gonna report what they actually decide. If the goal to reopen lies on not overwhelming the healthcare system, what has been the hospitalization rate of those tested positive? So the current uh, hospitalization rate for those testing positive is about 4.8%. Uh, put that in perspective, over a month ago, it was over 11%, and that makes sense, right? If you think about it, the number of people going to the hospital is actually not gonna change. But when this emergency first started, we were really only testing people who were presenting to the hospital. So of course, by definition, if you're testing somebody who's at the hospital, your hospitalization rate's gonna be higher. As we've expanded testing, then we're catching more people who either are not going to the hospital or may even be asymptomatic, but are testing positive with coronavirus. So one would expect that that hospitalization rate would drop as we expand testing, and that's exactly what's happened. Hospitalization rates uh, have dropped across the state to that 4.8%. And just so you know, that is also in line with what uh, the folks at UNMC said the hospitalization rate would be based upon the experience they saw in China. So that was the number they kind of gave us uh, when we first started talking about this at uh, the beginning of March. So just kind of an interesting fact that that all kind of, that, that actually proved to be accurate. With our positive rates rising at the same time mass testing has rolled out, how can we know that we are actually on the increase compared to when we had very low amounts of testing happening? Won't more testing naturally result more positives? Is it possible infection rates are level or dropping without mass testing data from earlier in the month compared to? So uh, Tiffany, actually you, you nailed this on the head. That's exactly why I say looking at the number of cases is really not a good measure because as we test more, we will get more positives. And again, if you're testing folks, as we've do, been doing more broad-based with, say, things like testnebraska.com, we've been getting a lower test positive rate. So that's why, again, we look for testing rates, the percent positives in pockets to see if that might be an early indicator that we've got gonna have an issue for our hospital system, but we're not using that as a, a sole measure for how we're determining whether or not we're reducing infection rates. And actually, if you look at the percent positive, our percent positive rates, those have been dropping uh, throughout most of the state in different regions. So uh, we actually are seeing those, those rates decline. But, but you've exactly hit the, tail, uh, uh, hit the nail on the head as to why we don't use that, those cases as a good ex uh, reason for how we're thinking about what's going on in the state. We look more at that hospitalization rate because those people are gonna go to the hospital whether they are tested positive for coronavirus or not, that's a real indicator of what's going on. Tyson Hervanic from uh, KRGI. Uh, what authority, if any, do uh, communities and mayors of those communities within the, health, uh, within the health department region have when it comes to reopening? For instance, the rural communities of Wood River, 
Cairo, Donovan all have seen the nearly, uh, uh, seen the nearly amount of COVID-19 positive cases, but are suffering simply because they're, they fall within the Central Health District, uh, which happens to be also where Grand Island and, and Hall County are. Do, any, uh, do they have any options to assist their local economies? No, they do not have the ability to do something that is less restrictive than what is going on with regard to the DHM in that public health district. So, and again, part of that is those communities are close to Grand Island. Uh, we're managing this as a public health district to be able to assist those public health directors in making good decisions about how we're protecting people broadly. So um, they do not have that ability to do something that's less restrictive. If daycares are able to increase their number of children of their approved license capacity to 15 um, kids a room, can the 10 student limit be increased to 15 for school rate rooms beginning June 1st? Uh, Tyson, just stay tuned on that one. We'll have more guidance with regard to that, so just stay with us. We'll, we'll have more information on that. Chris Doom, NTV. A recent Federal Trade Commission report states that some nursing homes and long-term um, skilled facilities may have required their residents who are on Medicaid to sign their stimulus checks over to the facilities, claiming that stimulus checks count as a resource under federal benefit programs that must be used to pay for services. So again, getting back to the Medicaid program, Medicaid is meant to, again, help people that have low resources, low, you know, they don't have any income, they've used up all their, um, you know, all their savings. For example, if you've got savings, you can't get into the Medicaid program to have that pay for your long-term care. So while nobody, uh, I've not had anybody talk to me specifically about this, uh, the fact that uh, folks are getting checks, resources, that they have to use those resources then to pay for their services under Medicaid uh, makes sense. We can certainly run that down and find out what all the rules are, but that would absolutely make sense that, again, you, Medicaid is a program for people who cannot afford to pay. If you can afford to pay, you're not supposed to be covered under Medicaid. Does that make sense? So Ryan Boyd, KG, KGFW, at the end of 2019, we were in phase one trade agreement with China, and some might say things were looking promising for Nebraska and the U.S. as a whole from that. Due to COVID-19, do you believe our trade partnership will change with China, or is it too early to make that statement, uh, too early to make a statement on that matter? I'd actually been in conversations with um, the office of our U.S. trade representative about a month ago, and at that time, they felt like even with the pandemic, China was going to be able to meet its obligations with regard to buying agricultural products from the United States. So now, granted, that was a month ago. Things may have changed. And of course, things can change really quickly in this whole pandemic anyway. But at least at that point, uh, the federal government felt like China was still going to make its commitments with regard to the purchases of our agricultural products. Aaron Hegarty, KMTV. What's the latest count you have on coronavirus cases in long-term care facilities? How many effective facilities? How many residents who have tested positive? Employees recovered? When you count a facility as affected, does it mean currently has a COVID case or did it at any point? And actually, we need to get an answer on that last one. Taylor, where'd you go, Taylor? Taylor, did we get it? Did we know? Uh, I think it's just total if you've been affected at any point. Is that correct? The numbers I'm about ready to read? Correct. I think that's correct. Okay. So with regard to the nursing home data, 380 residents. Uh, 62 deaths, that did not change from yesterday. Again, part of um, uh, some of the confusion is when I gave out a number that was people who had been reported uh, uh, that to have been um, a fatality because of coronavirus, but we actually need to do the, get the death certificate and get that verified. And so that's why this number, 62, is lower than what I was talking about last week. So, and that number hasn't changed this week yet. So 62 uh, fatalities. 280 staff, uh, we've had 89 facilities affected, 53 that are only staff only, uh, seven, is, seven with residents only, and 29 with both staff and residents. Uh, the CMS yesterday said they'll be releasing coronavirus case information for each certified facility in an online nursing home uh, compare tool later this month. Given it's only been the state's position to release only aggregate information, not the names of affected facilities that have been required to uh, report to local health districts. Will this change now? The federal the, will this change now that the federal government is planning on releasing information on each facility? So we at the state are not actually, not actually going to change what we're doing with regard to this. Again, if local public health departments want to release that information, again they need to confirm with the affected facility employment and things like that. I would also just caution that the federal government data can sometimes be 
significantly out of date. So for example, we had an issue with this uh, a few weeks ago where uh, one of the federal government websites, I think it was the CDC, was reporting 21 fatalities in Nebraska when we had a number that was much higher. But the disclaimer on that page is that the data can be up to eight weeks old. So uh, I've just cautioned that the, I think the expectation from people here is that it's going to be pretty much simultaneous, which is why we ask local public health departments to make sure they're confirming any information to make sure it's accurate. Uh, Leanna Ellis, Enterprise Media Group. Will the governor give any guidance to villages and cities regarding opening of pools for the summer? Will restrictions be lifted to allow pools to open the summer? So again, I would say just stay tuned. We've had phone calls with this with regard to um, the villages and the cities. And I know this is a concern for them. We are working on that, so I'd say just, just hope, uh, stay tuned for it. Uh, we will have some more information on that as we get closer to the end of the month. And Taylor, do you have questions that were texted at? Michael, the Dakota County Star says, if you look at the data, it seems like we've accomplished our goal of flattening the curve, and how much longer will we have restrictions in place that are going to be impacting small businesses? So again, what we want to do is we've preserved that healthcare system, right, that hospital capacity, so we've been very successful in that. What we're going to do is start taking steps to loosen these restrictions, like we did starting May 4th, to be able to allow, for example, restaurants to start having dine-in with you know, capacity restrictions. And we will continue to take those steps to loosen restrictions as we continue to have a stable hospital system and as we look forward in June. So now how long will we be doing this? Well, until there's a vaccination, we're going to be managing this virus until then. So this is something that people should be thinking about that we are going to be needing to do, I'm guessing, until at least the end of the year. Um, obviously, the administration has been talking about maybe a vaccine available somewhat sooner than that. But... We're going to be managing this for the rest of the year, so we're going to be doing something. Now, obviously, we want to loosen these restrictions to the point where we're managing this in a way that preserves that hospital capacity and allows as much of a normal return to life as possible. But again, we want to set everybody's expectation. We're going to be doing this for a while. We're going to look to loosen these restrictions gradually, a little bit at a time, to make sure we don't impact that hospital capacity and try to let people get back to a more normal life. And this is, again, where the testing and contact tracing is so important because the more we can focus on the people who have been infected and get them to isolate and quarantine, the more we can let everybody else go back to a more normal life. Melanie from the York News Times is asking, is there a projected date in which she'll be announcing the new direct health measures for June? Uh, Melanie, York News Times wants to know, is there a date that we're going to be looking to do to announce the directed health measures for June? I would say, uh, just stay tuned, Melanie. We don't have a date that we're ready to talk about that. Again, remember what I said is, we put these, we started loosening restrictions May 4th. We need two weeks. That was yesterday. <laughs> so now we got that two weeks of data that we can go back and look at. But just kind of stay tuned with us here as we kind of process that information, think about what our DHMs are going to be. So uh, I don't have a date I can give you right now, Melanie, but we will be getting back to folks with regard to that June, uh, the month of June, and what, loosening, what sorts of restrictions we'll be loosening. How long can people drink alcohol at a restaurant before they get kicked out? And also, she says that restaurants want signs for their customers. So Sarah Kirkley uh, from NTV wants to know, how long can a customer go to a restaurant and, and order a meal and drink alcohol before they get kicked out? And again, I think that that would be something that is going to be up to the, the restaurant's you know, determination on how long they want somebody to take up a table. Uh, for example, I think there might be restaurants who are setting the expectation that you're limiting how much time you're spending in those facilities or, you know, when you come to a restaurant that you've got a certain amount of time to eat your meal and they want to turn that table over because they're limited in capacity. And the second question was they want, sign, the, the, they want signs for their customers. I guess I'm not following what that means. Uh, they, she says that people are confused about how to obtain signage on guidelines. People are, oh, okay, so she, uh, so part of our guidelines, uh, the DHM, is that you had to post the DHM in your restaurant and those guidelines, and people are, uh, restaurant owners are looking for how they can do that. They just go to our website and print those, you know, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper off and post them there. That's a way to be able to do it, or they can make up their own signs that, you know, keep the same information. 
David Earl says the Omaha Chamber is reporting that they need enough coronavirus testing that we can capture asymptomatic cases. Will that ever happen? How close are we to that? So uh, David Earl is saying the Omaha Chamber is saying that they want to have enough testing to capture asymptomatic cases. And how long before we have that? Well, again, part of what you see with regard to um, testnebraska.com is that when we're doing the testing there, we may be capturing people who are asymptomatic if they're a healthcare worker, uh, working in the food processing industry, or a first responder, because we're not making symptoms a qualification for those folks to do it. Uh, you know, obviously the, chamber, the Omaha Chamber is it's really kind of up to them to decide how they want to manage the, uh, what advice they're giving to their members. But we are going to be continuing to look to expand testing. We've, as I mentioned, went from 22,200 tests over the course of the last week up from the 13,300 tests the week before that. So we're going to continue to look for ways to be able to expand Test Nebraska. And I would encourage the Omaha Chamber to get all their members to push out the testnebraska.com website and have all their folks sign up. What's your reaction to the president's announcement of the relief package for farmers? He says farmers and ranchers universally say they'd like to reproduce for the market, not government programs, and is this relief needed? So Steve White, NTV, wants me to react to the president's announcement with regard to the relief package for farmers and ranchers. I know the pre president was planning on doing something. I have not had a chance to see what that package is, and I know our farmers and ranchers would much rather have a market to be able to sell their goods into rather than be able to, that rather than getting government relief programs. However, I do think we're, with what's happened with commodity prices as a result of this pandemic, that that relief is needed, and I appreciate uh, anything the president can do for our farmers and ranchers. President Trump mentioned ending trade deals that import cattle. Given the value per head exports bring to Nebraska, would you ask the president to be cautious about that? So uh, again, I haven't seen what the president has talked about, but Steve is relaying that he talked about uh, ending importing capital, cattle into the United States. And so, yeah, I would certainly ask the, the administration to be cautious about that because, again, there's a whole supply chain that goes on with regard to the cattle industry. So we export very high-end, high-quality cattle to the rest of the world, but we also bring in uh, cattle that is, uh, would go into, say, hamburger meat, you know, where you're not necessarily looking for the top quality cuts to be able to go into that. So there is a whole supply chain that goes along with this that I think we want to make sure that whatever we do, certainly I appreciate the, the efforts to protect our ranchers, but we also need to be mindful of what that's going to do to the entire supply chain system. Ryan Boyd from KGFW wants to know if we're looking at loosening the restrictions of the Central uh, District Health Department because the number of cases is going down. Ryan Boyd from KFGW wants to know if we're looking at loosening restrictions in the Central uh, Public Health District because, again, this is where Hall and Grand Island are, probably the most uh, heavily impacted uh, part of our state, and are we looking at loosening restrictions? And I would say we've got ongoing dialogues with uh, Mayor Steele and Teresa Anderson, who's the local public health director, uh, with regard to that. So, again, stay tuned. Grant Schulte wants to know what you think of the business survey findings. Is there anything the state should be doing in reaction to it? Uh, Grant Schulte wants to know what we think of the business survey findings and is there anything the state should be doing about it. And again, that's what I said Tony Go Goins will be using the, that, the information in part that's in the survey as he starts crafting his plan for how we get Nebraska growing again. So this will be information that we use as part of the overall but, uh, you know, picture of the, things we, the steps we need to do to be able to help Nebraska businesses recover and get us back on that path. And finally, Charlie So the question was, uh, Charlie Brogan says we're not selling the data. What about the DNA samples? Are they be giving to law enforcement or immigration? The answer is absolutely not. Again, all, that, all the information we collect with regard to testnebraska.com is only being used for this Test Nebraska program. So we are not doing anything else with that information with regard to the test results or the DNA or anything like that. It is all being used for just testnebraska.com. That's all I got. Okay, great. Folks in the room. Lee. You mentioned that the information will be turned over to Tony for kind of what he'll do with it, but can you kind of just give like a, a candid answer on 90% or so the state's businesses have been affected? I mean, that's, that's a large percentage of the state's, you know, 
know, revenue, everything that we see, can you kind of just talk about the 90% kind of address that is? Yeah, I mean, the survey puts into quantitative terms what we all know, right? Which is that business has been dramatically impacted by this. That even businesses that, uh, you know, have continued to be able to sell have seen that they've had to make changes, whether it's how their customers are coming into their businesses or seeing customers being slow to make purchases. It is something that we know is impacting and the 87% uh, of businesses being impacted negatively really demonstrates how wide this problem is. I mean, this has been a, has a huge impact on Nebraska businesses and what the survey does is really, you know, quantify what we all kind of qualitatively already know. Yeah, Kathy, can you come up, please? What, what has been the biggest surprise to you of the information you got back as a result of the survey? I think that, as the governor mentioned, I think those of us who are working with businesses across the state have had our finger on the pulse of how they are feeling. I think to see it in quantitative terms so that we can actually analyze it has been really insightful. Um, for the ecosystem, I think what is very helpful about a report like this is it allows us to figure out what we can do individually in our programs, but collectively as an ecosystem to help support businesses. So the governor was talking a moment ago about the reopening, and there's great information that's come from the state of Nebraska for those industry sectors that are regulated by the state, but what about all the small businesses that don't have an entity that sort of oversees what they do, how are they opening? And so chambers, economic developers, um, the Nebraska Business Development Center, all are posting on our website ideas and concepts to allow businesses to figure out the best way for them to open it. Uh, reopen. And then what I would say to our consumers across the state is to be patient and respectful of our business owners as they are trying to navigate both the safety of their employees and themselves, and the safety of their customers. And it's an incredible balancing act that our small businesses are navigating right now. And so I think we have to be incredibly patient and respectful of what they're trying to do. The other thing that's out there in our state is incredible ingenuity and innovation about how to keep your business going. Our team at the Nebraska Business Development Center talks weekly, and the stories that we're hearing from our clients and from other businesses about the way they're trying to do business is absolutely inspiring. So our businesses are out there and committed to trying to keep things going. And so you can see that in, in some of the report information that's there. And, and you said one of the purposes of this was to make recommendations to policymakers. Is there one that has bubbled up to the top that you can share? So thank you, Fred, for that, because what it's not doing is really making recommendations. What we're trying to do is lay out um, information that businesses are providing us so that policymakers can consider that information. So this report is really a broad report for policymakers to be able to look at and then think about what are the tools we currently have in the state, um, again, each of us in the ecosystem is thinking about what we can do with our current resources to respond to what we're hearing from businesses. I, we are all very excited for the second survey because it's going to sort of give us that longitudinal picture about what our business is doing, how are they reacting, and how have some of the programs that have been provided supporting them currently. So we're very excited for the second go round on the survey. I had a couple of questions. Uh, you talk about how businesses are working hard to maintain their employees and their employee hours. Can you give us some statistics on that, or some data that backs that up? And would, do you have any numbers on how successful they are? How many businesses are doing that? Or what? So we do have some information on what the, oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, what are businesses trying to do right now to help maintain the number of hours and the number of employees they have? What are we seeing in the report in terms of data that helps to prove that out? 
What we know from this point in time survey is that they were that they were having impact to their revenue and that they were trying to maintain the number of employees they had and the number of hours they had. That we know from this survey. What will be interesting is from the second survey, is there a shift in that? The other thing we also know is that the programs that have been provided so far from the federal government, whether that's PPP or EIDL through the uh, Small Business Administration, has been intentionally targeted to help businesses maintain employees in numbers of hours. So we believe that we, we will see in that second, second survey how have those programs helped them? Did those programs help businesses do exactly that? You said the top concern was this pandemic would decrease citizens' confidence in their spending. So the uh, what are they saying? So people aren't going to come back through the door again. So what? So one of the questions that has been asked is what uh, uh, regarding the consumer confidence uh, relative to the top concerns that were expressed by business, and that was the third concern expressed. I'm sure businesses are very concerned about when will customers be comfortable coming back into my establishment and doing business with me. And you can imagine in that period of time, April 15th to 24th, every business was asking that question. Now, as things have started to change, what will we see when we do the resurvey in early June as things have opened up? Will they be feeling more confident about consumers coming back? But it is an incredible challenge as these businesses are reopening their doors to their customers. So the question that's being asked is, are we hearing from businesses about the challenges that they are facing? And the answer to that question is, we are hearing that. So I can speak specifically for the clients that we serve at the Nebraska Business Development Center. Our consultants across the state are sharing any and all resources that we are seeing with those businesses to help them consider for themselves what is the best way for me and for my employees to open our doors to our customers. And so we've been sharing the ideas that businesses have shared back to us about whether they're requiring masks, how many people are they allowing in their store, and how are they navigating that. And so we are, we are doing that across that entire ecosystem. We know communities are doing that. We know chambers are doing that. And so for a business to look out onto the web and go to the Nebraska State Chamber of Commerce and Industry. They have a number of guidelines um, that help businesses consider how to reopen. We are doing the same on the Nebraska Business Development Resiliency page. Um, and so we're all trying to share those resources in as many ways as we can so that businesses have the easiest access to that information. Kathy? Other questions? Yeah, Paul. Sure. Give me just a second. 380 residents have tested positive, 280 staff, 89 total facilities have been affected, 53 with staff only, 7 with residents only. And 29 with both staff and residents. And 62, yes. And 62, yes. Fatalities. And, and just to be clear, are you, are you saying that if the death certificate says the cause of death was COVID, then they're counted as a... Right. So the doctor or the medical examiner makes a determination on the death certificate, whether or not it was coronavirus related. And if they say it was coronavirus related, that's how we count it. So it's, it's, it would include the number of people who had it with COVID. So again, we're picking up, yeah, we're picking up whatever they say. It, if they said that was the leading cause or that was the cause of death, then that's what we're picking up. So I keep getting questions from bar owners and group of kind of people I run into, and they go, well, how come we got to shut down and restaurants can open? They, they think some places are kind of gaming the system by they, maybe they have a hot dog roll or that 
that's all they have. What, what, what can you tell them about the, why they are forced to shut down in these maybe makeshift restaurants or, or not? Sure. So the question was, why bars and not restaurants? So again, it gets back to we're looking at avoiding large groups of people gathering. And if you think about a restaurant, people generally go into a restaurant and they sit down at tables. And so, again, remember, both, neither one were allowed to have dine-in or bar-in or whatever you want to call it. Initially, we, as a first step at the beginning of this month, we said we relaxed the restriction on restaurants so that they could have 50% of their capacity, but no in capacity for bars as taking a step on this program. So first of all, I'd say to the bar owners, that's a step, right? This is not something that's permanent. It's a step as we make sure we preserve that hospital capacity by doing this a step at a time. If you think about bars, they have lots of people that are not sitting at tables but have standing capacity, right? So there's people standing in those facilities. They have people at bars and so forth. So it's just a, it's an environment that is much more conducive to spreading virus. And so that's why bars were treated differently from restaurants. Uh, now, you mentioned something about maybe some bars are trying to game the system. If there is a bar who is serving food they're not supposed to be, then please let us know. But there's no system to game. It's either if you are an establishment that has a food license, I think that's permit number, it's a zero one on your permit, then you are allowed to be open. If you are a bar or a, an organization that does not have that food license, you only have a liquor license, then you are not. You can't, if you don't have the food license, you can't just start serving popcorn or a hot dog and be open. That's, not, that's the way it works. I think you're saying it works the other way, too, that they look down the street and they see a, a bar that serves some food. Now they're only serving chicken wings. They're open until 2 a.m. Uh, are they serving chicken wings until 2 a.m.? They don't think so. They, they so, there. well, again, again, if they, they think there's some other competitors that aren't following the rules, then I would say go check them out, and if you've got a complaint, file the complaint with us and we will, you know, we can follow up on it. So, but what we're expecting is that people will broadly do the right thing. And I would say also just stay tuned. We're working on our guidelines or what we're going to do for June. So we'll look to take another step in June. And so we understand that, again, bar owners are feeling the impacts of the restrictions we're putting in place. We understand that. And we'll be looking to take other steps as we go into June. Time for one or two more questions. Yeah, Lee. There was that talk about the survey further in June. Can you kind of give some hopes or expectations? You've looked in a lot of restrictions for uh, places to reopen. From now till then, what you're hoping to see and the expectations come that second round of survey, what the numbers may or should look like? Well, again, it's going to be difficult to know what a survey may look like, given that we still even haven't announced what our changes for June are going to be. So I'm, I'm going to defer on that. I really don't know what the survey will look like. Hopefully, though, we can take additional steps to loosen some of these restrictions and we'll allow people to get back to a more normal life. And that hopefully will be reflected in the survey, but it may be too soon for that survey to reflect it. John. Um, on the evictions, um, were you hearing from landlords or you know, like, um, housing management companies and anything like that saying that they need you to get rid of this executive order to make sure that they can pay their bills? Well, we get a lot of feedback from different groups with regard to all of our issues, including the ones on evictions. Uh, in our estimation, again, given that the pandemic unemployment assistance out there is $600 a week and that we are catching up, you know, we cleared two-thirds of the, the backlog we had you know, from that first week of April uh, and all the other resources that are out there available, we were concerned that we didn't want renters to fall too far behind on the rent because the further you fall behind, the harder it's going to be to be able to catch that up. So that was one of the things that weighed into our decision. Uh, we, we got feedback on both sides with regard to that, but really being concerned about renters falling too far behind was one of the main drivers for why we wanted to, uh, you know, set that expectation that people need to continue to pay their rent, especially since the pandemic unemployment coming out there was $600 a week was going to be available. Last question. Yeah. Will there be more surveys done after June, or will that be the last one? So, Kathy, will there be more surveys done after June? We may do one in the fall, sir. We may do one in the fall. So, yes, there may be additional surveys in the fall. Again, folks, thank you very much for coming here this afternoon to talk about what the state is doing to fight the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. I appreciate all of Nebraskans' work to be able to follow our six rules and to slow the spread of the virus here in our state. Thank you so much. Your sacrifices have been working. We're all going to get through this together. 
Please stay tuned for what we're going to do in the future with regard to loosening some of these restrictions to, restrictions to allow people to get back to a more normal life. We'll see you uh, either 5 p.m. tonight for the Spanish language briefing or 2 p.m. tomorrow for the English language one. Thank you.